Amen. Well, welcome everyone. Hasn't the men's advance been awesome so far? Man, all the all of the uh, messages already. We could go home today. This this is a workshop, and we call it a workshop on purpose because we're going to talk about things from a, a much more practical perspective on your finances. And uh, I'm going to do a couple of things here. That I'm going to do one thing I normally don't do in these workshops. In this these particular workshops. I do it in other workshops. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what I call the triple X factor. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I know many of you are new, and so I'm going to take just a little bit of time. But then the meat of this thing is when I'm going to talk about where I believe we're going economically here in the next 12 to 18 months. And I got a ton ton of stuff I want to show you on that, charts and graphs. Uh, And then I want to end up uh, talking today in the two sessions. We'll go about 45 minutes, and in the first session, we'll take a break. We're going to go 45 minutes in the second session, but about 20 minutes in the last part of the second session, I'll leave for, for Q&A. And I'm going to talk about where the economy is during this part. I'm going to talk about gold and silver. I'm going to talk about real estate. I'm going to talk about the stock market. I'll do something on crypto. Usually that comes up in the questions in the Q&A stuff, and I'll do that. I'll talk about what some people right now are worried about on March the 11th with the banks. So I'm going to cover a lot of things here today, but I'm going to start off first with more of a personal finance uh, that I want to uh, talk to you about. And before I do that on your own personal finance, and I'll do that fairly quickly, I have two books I want to give away. How many of you like free books? Now, I think I have, I think I have seven seven. I think it's seven different books back there. This is only two. This is the first one called God's Road to Financial Freedom. It and the other book that's back there called Money Mastery, it has this first part that was up there a while ago of the triple X and a lot of other information. In here is the nine steps to getting out of debt, including your mortgage. And believe me, just to have that in the book by itself. I also talk about the seven steps you take personally to get to finance freedom, to financial freedom, nine steps to getting out of debt, including your mortgage. But I don't teach a lot just on getting out of debt. I don't teach a lot just about financial order, even though that's all in here. What I talk to you about is how you build wealth. Because Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18 says that God has given us the power to get wealth. One translation says the power to create wealth. Another, another translation says the power to acquire wealth. And so wealth coming to your life comes in two primary ways. Either you create it or you acquire it. And so I, talk, I spend a lot of time both in the books and the teaching talk about that, talking about that. I'll do that today. This book uh, has all of that in there. I have a brand new book co- coming out called The Laws of Wealth. I have 18 laws of wealth that I teach on. And a, uh, I think four or five of those laws of wealth are in this book. So Mac, find somebody right now that looks like they need financial freedom. And then this is a book that Mike and Carrie use a lot here at Cares. It's called Change Mastery. And the reason that uh, when Big Andrew was teaching, I call him Big Andrew, Andrew Womack was teaching today, he was talking about you know the importance of who we are in Christ and our identity with Christ. So was Jeremy as well, and talking about those things, but we got to get our mind renewed to it. So this book is not just about Romans 12 too. It, it's full of Romans 12 too, but I talk about the how-tos. For example, I make a statement in here where I say, every change in your life begins with an ending. I make statements like this, most people don't resist change, they resist loss. So in other words, the change that we have to go through, most people aren't willing to be able to pay the price. I had to go through this level to be able to build wealth in my life and to do what I'm doing today here at Andrew Womack Ministries because my mind and my thinking were so limited. And so this book is really about my personal journey of going from where I was years ago to where we are today. And it's called Change Mastery. So give this to somebody that looks like they really need change in their life, amen. Uh, So today we're going to get started. I want to introduce our team. Chad, I want you and your team to stand back here. This is Chad Franson, and Chad is uh, with me in what we call Wealth Builder Investments. 
It's a normal investment company. And he's got his team here with him. And I've got uh, Josh and Joe. Y'all raise your hands. And then I've got Caleb who helps me run Tricord Global as well as with Wealth Builder Investments. So I want to introduce those to you if you want to come up, talk to them. Those guys will be glad to talk to you afterwards. So let's get started and we'll jump in and I'm going to do several things here with you. Several years ago, back uh, uh, now, it would be back in the early 1980s, I, uh, I developed this chart, if we can go ahead and put that up there. And this was something for me personally uh, that I used. And one of the things that I want to show you about it, this, uh, this has to do, as I said, primarily with your personal finances, is I created this chart that I'm going to go through uh, with you fairly quickly. Uh, I created it because I could not get my head around how to really grow wealth in my life. I had, I had two really significant mentors in my life. One's name was Ed and the other was named John. They were both very successful businessmen who came into my life when I was 24 years old. And they taught me all kinds of things about money and they, would, they were always talking about it at a level that I couldn't quite get a hold of. And so in the process of my journey, I began to learn some things during that age period of my 24, 25, 26, 27, through that period. And I took a three, one of these uh, three foot wide white poster boards. How many of you remember that? You remember those? And I drew on the, this, this vertical axis here, I drew basically zero to 10,000 in those days. This is how I did it. This, this graph for this day and age, many people make more than that now in this day and age. But back then, if you made $10,000 a month, that was a lot of money in the early 1980s. If you made, so I had, I had 10,000 right here at the top. And I remember I started, and down here on the bottom, these are months. And so I started in January. And uh, this, every one of these lines would represent one month, for example. So if I started in January, this would be January. And I started graphing my income. And that's the black dot. So I'd just say, and I made a pretty steady income in those days, kind of a salary. And so I would, I would graph the dot, each dot as I went per month. But then I started graphing my expenses. And in my case, not everybody's case would be like this, but in my case, I was actually spending more in my early mid-20s than I was bringing in every month. And people go, well, how can you do that? Well, it's called consumer credit or credit cards. And so I would actually take how much I was spending and I realized when I got about right in here, if I don't stop what I'm doing right up in here, if I don't stop what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna be in trouble for a long time. And so what I started doing was I took the kind of the old, the old teaching. If, how many of you remember Larry Burkett? Anybody remember Larry Burkett? I took the old teaching many years ago, Larry Burkett teaching about how to get out of debt. He, didn't, he doesn't teach the debt snowball exactly the way we do in the book, but his original teaching impacted my life. And I started, now how many of you know there was a Larry Burkett before there was a Dave Ramsey? Okay, just so you know, make sure we're good. And what I did was I started bringing my debt, my monthly expenses because of no longer putting money on credit cards, no longer having to pay credit cards. And I learned how to start paying my debt off. And uh, because of that, the, these pink dots began to come down. And then what happened was in my life, I started making a little more money because I learned that money is attracted, not pursued. Because if you pursue money, it becomes the God of mammon. So money's attracted, not pursued. And what I began to do was I began to improve myself. I learned, you, I learned you take value to the marketplace. You don't take time to the marketplace. Let me give you all a nugget here today. You don't get paid for time. You get paid for value. So I started taking value to the marketplace and I started making more money. And this absolutely happened just about like this, truthfully. Just time-wise, that was about how quick it happened. And I got down here and I got out of debt Right here, I now had, I was out of debt and I had less expenses every month than I had money coming in. And this is a true story that happened to me was that the, ne the, the next question I had was, what do I do now? Now that I'm out of debt, now that I've got more money coming in than I do going out, what do I do now? And so in the process of this, really through trial and error, 
I actually, back in those days, in my 20s, I started investing in real estate very slowly, very slowly. You know, if I did one property a year back in those days right there, that was a big deal, meaning investment property. And I started having rent, rental income that came in and I started graphing it. So right here, if I had some positive cash flow from my rents, I started graphing it just like I did my regular job income right here on the first X. And I started graphing it and I got stuck. Some of you don't know this part of the story. So I'm going to tell you that for all of you in here today, this will be new. Miss Becky, that's my wife. She, she told me I needed to tell this story. I was about right in here and uh, on this graph anyway. And uh, let me see if I can get that back up. I was, about, I was about right in here. And I remember a really famous minister came to me as I got a little older, toward when I was late 30s and early 40s, I think I was late 30s, and he flew in to where I was on his own private jet. Uh, unless you've read the book, I've done, you've never heard me tell this publicly. And uh, he flew in on his own private jet. We had a conference, and then he and I and another well-known minister in those days, we went to the mountains to kind of get some R&R. &R. We went to the hot springs here up in the Colorado mountains, up toward Buena Vista, and we went in the hot springs, and I remember this guy that flew on this big airplane, private jet who he, that he owned, and I remember we get in the, in the hot springs, and he started, uh, I remember he put his hands on top of the water to see if it was, and he got in, and he, he said, uh, I thought he was going to talk about the conference or whatever, and I remember him looking at me, and he said to me, he said, Billy, he said, what are you doing for retirement? Well, I'd already been doing some of these things I'm showing you. I was... I had this, these green dots, some of those working that I kind of came up with and I had some of those things working. But I said, really, I haven't taken it seriously. And he looked at me and he said this to me. He said, if I did not, have, remember he flew in on a jet. He said, if I did not have my ministry, he said, I'd be personally broke in 90 days. That's what he told me. And it rocked my world because I thought he was what I was aspiring to be in my mind. That's what I was aspiring to be. And so I began to, from that process, after I asked him questions, I left from that trip and I came back and began a really diligent journey. At this time, I, I was worth a little bit of money at that time, but I began to get very aggressive about what I was doing. And what I did was, is I started investing much heavier than I'd ever done. And I was able to actually build my income to a point from, this is called passive income, the green dots or passive income, I was actually able to build my income fairly quickly through that. And so I got to a point right here where I was able to quit my job because I now had more income from my assets than I did outgo in my debt or my living expenses. And so because of that, I didn't even have to have the black dots or the job income to be able to live because I had enough in passive income. That was the journey that I went on. And when I got here to this point, uh, I did right in here, I got in here financially independent to the point where I did all of that for the wrong reasons because it was about me and I did it for what I could have and what I could accomplish. And what I didn't realize was God was teaching me how to do this for kingdom purposes and God had to get a hold of my heart and change me. And that's where the third X came from is when I began to learn that I, did, I don't have to just give out of my income now. I can actually give away some of my wealth as I continue to progress through the wealth building process. And I learned how then to begin to function in the third X. I'm not just paying my tithes. I'm not just bringing offerings now. I'm also taking, I can take larger chunks of assets or cash and give those or invest those for the kingdom of God. And I, and I got to the point of being able to get to what we talk about today, the third X. Now, let me tell you where, where my challenge is when I stand here before you or I have a Wealth Builders Conference. My challenge is this, is that what I find in the body of Christ is that we are told that we can prosper, we're told that we should prosper, but nobody's telling us how to prosper. Let me try that one more time. We're told that we can prosper. We're told that we should prosper, but nobody is telling us how to prosper. 
And it's really the how-tos that are where the secret is. And the how-tos are not just about how do you get out of debt, but it's how do you actually grow and build wealth. And so this, this is the framework that I have used over the years. So Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 3 says, Through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a life, a home, a family is built, and by understanding it is established on a good and sound foundation. And by knowledge shall its chambers of every area be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. And so the truth is, is that what a lot of Christians do is, is they kind of try to take the shortcut where if they need wisdom for something when, it be, when it's financial in their life, instead of doing the work that they need to do, which is first of all, going over here and getting some knowledge and learning about how to do things, we try to go over in the other corner and every time we get in a little financial difficulty, we ask God for wisdom. Now I know that's scriptural from James chapter one, any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. But the truth is, if you follow this verse that we have up here, the order of the way wisdom comes in our life is we have to first of all get some knowledge about what to do. That's the reason we're having the workshop this afternoon. What do you do? You have to get some knowledge. But then, watch this, then you have to graduate to getting some understanding of what it is that you need to do. And I give an example. I have four grandsons. They all play baseball, and, uh, and because I'm a good pawpaw, how many of you are pawpaws? Have some pawpaws. Because I'm a good pawpaw, I built them a real batting cage in the backyard with a real iron mic pitching machine that they plug in. And then I bought them a few other things that are back there that they have to be able to practice baseball, and they all play. And Iron Mike will throw the Iron Mike I bought them will throw about 90. That's about what it'll throw. But most of them, when they're, they're younger, the younger ones, they're hitting at about 55 or 60 miles an hour. That's about where they're hitting right now. They're learning to hit. So they can learn to hit in the batting cage, but, or I can throw them a grounder and they can throw it back to me. But, so I'm teaching them to get knowledge, but they don't develop understanding until they get in the game and start playing against kids their own age and they understand the speed of the ball and they develop understanding in the game. So here's what a lot of Christians do. Not only do they don't go over here and get the practical knowledge they need on finances, that's number one, but then number two, if you don't start applying what you learn, you're not going to develop understanding. Understanding only comes as you get in the game and do it. Now, once you develop understanding, that's where real wisdom comes along. Now, as I stand here today with you, <clears throat> and I got some of our executives. In fact, Andrew, I want to introduce you and Mike. So why don't you stand real quick? This is Andrew Wirtz, our COO uh, here at the ministry. Some of you know him. I call him, I call him Little Andrew. And then this is Mike. Y'all have seen Mike up here standing. Mike is now our executive vice president for the ministry. And, and they're here because they have to be, because I'm speaking. <laughs> Settle down, it's okay. And then I got several executive, executive directors here. Y'all stand up. Executive directors, we've got a bunch of, let's give them a hand. All these guys are what makes it work. And so as we start talking about this today, it's knowledge, it's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom that you have to get in order to be able to do what God is really calling you and calling us in the body of Christ. And I've got some young men in here that are listening to me right now, and I really want, I want to talk to all of you, old and young. You know, I'm only 39. How many of you can tell that already? I've been married 49 years, going on 50, actually. I'm in my 50th year. But what I want to do here for a little bit is talk about where I believe that we're headed economically, but in doing so, I want you to understand and I want to challenge you that you begin to take practical steps yourself to start understanding how to build wealth. And those are the things that I want to encourage you in so you understand. And Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And so the knowledge part that we're talking about over here is so important. And then in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32, 
It says, from the sons of Iskar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do, their chiefs were 200 and all their kins kinsmen were at their command. And that's in the New American. And I love the part I bolded it for you. The men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel ought to do. Now look, for real, I'm 68 years old and I'm telling you my age on purpose because I have never seen a more unusual time economically than I'm seeing right now. Now, I've been through some weird economics. I mean, I remember I did my first big loan in real estate in 1981. How many of you remember 1981? You remember what our interest rates were in 1981? And I got that first loan. I think it was about $900,000 in those days for real estate. And I got that first loan and I had to pay 14% interest, and I thought I was getting a bargain. That's a fact. And so I've seen all kinds of economic times that I've been through and that I've lived through. And so, but the real truth is we are living in, in aspects of the current economy that is different than anything we have historically ever seen. And I'm going to prove it to you with some things as we go through this. So the question is, on what are the causes and effects that we deal with? And then I'll tell you how we need to work on it and apply it. But there, how many of you realize that in coming out of COVID, we not only went through this weird time with vaccine uh, mandates and all kinds of things. You, some of you know the story about what we went through here as we continue to meet and had to deal with it. But also the, the COVID situation affected us financially, not just only in our personal finances, but also at a national level. And one place that it affected us was in the money supply. Now I want you to hear me on this because historically this will show you uh, where we've been as a nation. I have some that are longer graphs. This graph goes back to a little bit before 07, about 05 is really where this graph goes back to. I think it's January 06, excuse me. January of 06 and you can see the money supply. And, that, and what, what that means is the money supply is how many dollar bills, what's called the M1 supply, how many dollar bills are actually in circulation in the economy at one time? And if you look, when we went into COVID, and I have one graph, I'm not sure it's in this group, it goes all the way back to 1890. And if you look at the trend, we have never had this kind of upshot anywhere close to the amount of dollar bills that were in the economy. So when COVID happened, the government and the central bank flooded our economy to keep us from crashing with dollar bills. I thought by now, when I'm sitting here in March of 2024, I thought most of that money would have washed through the economy, but it's still there. And if you see this acceleration of this kind of money supply in the economy, let me ask you this question real quick. If you have this much money compared to what you had back here, that's actually in circulation, what happens to assets? What happens to real estate? Very candidly, what happens, for example, to the stock market, which I'm going to show you in a minute. What happens to other assets is they go up in value. And in some, kind, in some instances, in fact, in the case, I'm going to show you several things here where things have gotten so overvalued that people really right now don't have a sense of, of what I call intrinsic value in true assets because our money supply has been flooded uh, since 2020. So when the market went down in March of 2020 and the government and the central bank began to print all this money, that's true in all Western nations and in many developing nations, this was true, but we've never had this kind of, of uh, money supply that's ever hit us. Now the M1 supply just means the money you have in your pocket, the money you have in your checking account. There's another supply called the M2 supply and that's primarily money that's in CDs like certificates of deposit or money market funds. And if you, if you see this, I'll put this up here, it went straight up. It started to come down here right at the end of 23. You can see it kind of trailing down. But let me show you something here that I think is a powerful graph. This is the money supply going back, are you ready now, to 1870. I have another graph later that's 1890. Going back to 1870. Here's where the money supply growth is. It means that they have turned off the spigot. 
right? And the, where our money supply is right now, it has our, the diminishing of the money supply has not been this low till 1933. So some of this stuff is in the market right now. Some of this money is still in the market that I just said, which drives asset prices up. But our money supply growth, you can see how far, see how far it went up right there? And if you go all the way back here to 1870, this right here is the Great Depression. Now, do I have anybody here that was, I don't think I do, because you'd have to be 100 and, 103. I don't think I have anybody here that went through the Great Depression. My dad went through the Great Depression. And I hear his stories all the time about different things back when he was alive. But I want you to see, this is what happened to the money supply here. Then I got to go back to 1920. Then I got to go all the way over here to 1890. Then I got to go back here toward 1880. The point is there's some weird stuff happening right now in the economy. And we've kind of got to be aware of it. And the truth is, is, is if the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, it's high time the righteous started figuring out what to do with it. What's amazing to me is we quote that scripture and what I think we think is going to happen is that, is that uh, we're going to inherit somebody's wealth or something's going to happen over here and it's going to come to us. Uh, Chad and I, because we have a fund called the Solomon Fund, we made an investment in the new group called the Wander Project, which came out of, which came out of um, the Chosen film and what was the other group? the Jesus Revolution film. And so they were raising $100 million. And so they raised $100 million to create a, I'm, this is probably not a good description, so forgive me, but like a Christian Netflix. It's a total Christian born again, non-woke uh, type, type Netflix. So, so we invested some money with it and so did some, quite a few other investment groups invested in it. And uh, right there in that one meeting, they were in Dallas or so, they raised $100 million right there. We, can, we, we were part of that. And then it, it, as, they, as they started developing, Amazon, the big Amazon, Amazon Prime came along and they said, we love your, what you're doing. We don't understand why the people who subscribe to Amazon Prime are watching all of your Christian shows because we don't understand your market. All we know is we're making a lot of money out of it. So they came in when, when they did the second offering and Amazon put 200 million in in one investment. Well, guess what, 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 guess what that did to the 100 million? It make it worth more money. And you say, what does that mean? That's called the wealth of the wicked laid up for the righteous. Amen. It's called a wealth transfer. You understand that? So when we're talking about these kind of things, you got to learn how to think differently. And when I'm talking about money supply and where we are, Many times when we see stuff like this, those are the times when the greatest wealth transfers happen. So we've come through money supply. Now look what's happened. Now we're coming through what I call this whole interest rate thing that we've been in. And this is where interest rates, here's 1980 that we talked about. And you see how this was under Reagan, Reagan actually started raising interest rates because inflation was getting out of hand. And we see now where interest rates have come down. And here's from 2010 to about 2015. And then we get over here to 2020, right here when COVID happened and interest rates went back down to zero. So here's what happens. We had all this money in the economy we have interest rates. We basically have money that's not costing anything because it's at 0% interest. And again, I ask the question, so then what happens to assets? What happens to assets is right here. This is interest rates coming down. This is assets going up. So how many of you have ever heard the term bubble? You ever heard the term bubble? So when we look at some of the assets, including real estate, which I'm gonna show you later, we have to be careful that we're not in a bubble when it comes to our finances or what we're investing in. We have to have some awareness of what's happening in that situation. And so 
we've come through this money supply. We've come through what I call the low interest rate environment, which is now starting to come up. So I used this graph, this exact graph last year. Most of these graphs are brand new from last year. This is, this is a, the same graph from last year. And what, what, here's what happens when these interest rates started coming up. This one shows here a Fed rate of about 4%, kind of pushing 4%. That Fed rate now is a little over 5%. It's right in here. It's right in here. And what's happened with assets, the minute that interest rates start going up, assets start coming down. Do you see that? And so you say, what does that mean? Well, one thing I'll talk to you about in the second session is don't be afraid, for example, to invest in some things right now. I'm not, I'll tell you later what they are, but don't be afraid to invest in some things just because money is a little more expensive, because what happens is, is you can get the asset for a lower price. Real estate is only one example, but you, you, if you buy right, you can get it for a lower price. So what this does is it helps you be begin to get a perspective. And what I do internally in my own personal life is I track, for example, I track assets against the price of gold. And then I track gold against the price of other assets to try to figure out exactly where would a good entry point or a good place to be able to make investments would be. And so this is just one example of, this is an example, the orange line, and this orange line represents stock values plus single family home values. Stock values and single home values combined, that's what this orange line is, and you can see going back to 1970, you can see that we've been on an upward trend with some downturns through here, but you can see that upward trend has been in direct relationship to, the, uh, to what our interest rates are. So in other words, I want you to see that the minute that interest rates start coming up, asset prices uh, actually begin to come down. Now, when you see that, it takes a little while for everybody, you, me, and the marketplace to actually register where, where you are. But let me explain this to you. There's going to be some opportunity in real estate. There's going to be some, and I'm right now I'm talking about single family real estate. If I have time, I'll show you some stuff on commercial property and I'll give this to you for free. I'm telling you, we haven't seen the regional bank reckoning yet. The regional bank that have heavy exposure to office properties, and, and uh, in some cases, retail properties that are out there, I believe we're going to see some more regional bank failures because of that. But what that means is if you're prepared, you and I can take advantage of it because the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Now, how many of you have heard, if you haven't, I'm not going to talk about it. How many of you have heard of, of what's happening on March the 11th with some of the banks? Have you heard of it? Some of you have heard so on March 11th, then it's only a couple of you, I'll just, I'll just say this. I think the overall banking system, which I know some people are prophesying it's going to collapse. I don't believe that. But I do believe there's going to be some shaking that happens in regional banks, and we're going to start seeing that happen here in about six months. We're going to start seeing it again. If you remember Silvergate, I think it was Silvergate and uh, the other one in California that failed and the one in New York. And what that means is there's going to be some assets out there uh, that are going to be available for those that are prepared and, and know what they're doing. So I've talked about, watch this, money supply, interest rates, and then here in this portion, the last thing that I want to cover, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, in the next session, we're going to go straight into talking about real estate and gold, silver, and some other things that will help you see the perspective. But here on this one, on bond prices, I just want you to see something that's really unusual. In fact, I'll read this to you. It says the New York Federal Reserve uses the yield curve to calculate the probability that the U.S. economy will be in a recession in 12 months. Currently, the New York Fed assigns a 61% probability that the U.S. will be in a recession in January of 2025. Now, this is the New York Fed that's assigning, that's saying there's a 61% probability. Remember now, remember what uh, we read in 1 Chronicles 12, that the sons of Issachar understood the times. So if you understand the times we're in, we're in right now what is called in the bond market a inverted yield curve. And what that simply means is, is that uh, a 90-day bond, treasury bond today, has a higher interest rate 
than a 10-year bond. And you say, well, what does that mean? That means that typically, historically, in all time, if you look back except in times of inverted yield curves, your, uh, a longer term bond is always paying a higher interest rate because you're locking your money up for longer and so it pays a higher interest rate. In this day and age, the 10 year is actually about a full percentage point lower than the 90 day. So you say, well, Billy, can you interpret that for me? Yeah, it's telling you that the Federal Reserve has no clue what's going to happen. <laughs> They're hedging their bets. They're saying, we're going to, for 10 years, we're going to pay you four and a quarter, 4.2%. But if you invest in our 90 day, we're going to pay you 5.2%. That's what they're saying. And so they're saying that we're in this unusual time economically, but if we recognize it and discern the times, then we're able to be able to make decisions and understand what's going on. So here's a couple of slides I'll show you. Got some effects there, it looks like. Here's one on the 90 day. Right now, March the 7th, 2024, the 90 day treasury bond is paying 5.24%. And I'll tell you, if you want some investment advice, I'm not giving to you personally. I'm just strictly teaching. A 90-day bond right now is a really good deal. Really good. You're only locking up for 90 days. The 10-year bond is not a good deal. And you say, so, so for me, you know, what, what, you know, how do I apply that? What, it, what it's telling you is that we are in weird times and without exception, everybody watch me now, Without exception, it has never, when this has happened, it has never not been true that the U.S. economy has gone into a recession. So some of the things that we're dealing with right now, I'm running out of time to deal with the stock market, but some of the things that we're dealing with right now are in some ways unprecedented other than there have been other times when the bond curve, yield curve has been inverted and in every instance we have hit a recession. So I believe God, I'm standing on the word. For me, I don't believe I'm personally gonna go through a recession. Instead of being a recession, it's gonna be a time of economic opportunity. So inflation has finally came down. I showed you this one last year. I showed you this one uh, a couple of years ago. In April, this is where inflation was, a little above 8%. Today, we've actually got inflation, see if I can get to this other one, we've actually got inflation down somewhere around three, a little above 3% is where, where inflation is right here, is where we are today. But what, how that matters to us in the stock market and things like that when we look at it, in 2002, the stock, 2022, I'm sorry, the stock market was right here. This is when I showed this to you two years ago. And I told you that the stock market was overheated. How many of you know that the stock market in, 20, in 2024 has been going straight up? I mean, it's been incredible the way to, to see it. But if you look at, I told you then it was overheated. I told you in 2022. So even though you're seeing it go up now, let me show you. If I jump where we are I think I have this one where we are right now. Wrong one, let me get to that one. My slides are moving on me, sorry. This one right here, we look at the Buffett indicator of the stock market. In 2022, we were right up here when I showed it to you two years ago. You can see how much the market has come down since then and the date of this graph is uh, January the 31st, 2024. So it's gone, it's about right here, right now. And you remember I told you this in here, what's gonna happen is it's gonna come down because this right here is what we call the median line, median trend line for the market on values. You can see how it's gone up, come down, come down. Uh, I believe the market is gonna come down to right in here before we see a real turn to go back up. In fact, if I show you the valuations right now, you can see the orange and red going all the way back to 1950. I want to say it one more time. Going back to 1950, the only time this graph has shown these levels of orange and red 
were, you know, we didn't even show it in 2008 crisis. We didn't even show it then. But in 2000, in the internet bubble, and where we've been right now, this is about the S&P with colors indicating that it is overvalued. So if any of you want to take a picture of that graph, that's a good graph to give you a historical perspective on where we've been as far as the stock market is concerned and where I think we're going. Now, what I've done here in this, in this particular time we've had together, and we're going to take a break, what I've done is I've shown you where we've come from, and I'm doing that. In the, now, I hope, I hope you appreciate the fact that I'm kind of talking about the how-tos and understanding stuff as opposed to just teaching generalities. What I'm going to do in the next session is I'm going to talk about the how-tos of where you need to go. Is that good? And so we're gonna, I'm going to talk about steps you need to take and things you need to do to do that. So before we take a break, I want to show you one video. Do you guys have the video ready? Talk about, and I want to show you one of our, our graduates from business school on this video. And when I'm done with that, then we'll take a break. Hello, welcome to The Farm Uganda. My name is Samuel. The Farm Uganda Limited is a community-based farm. We do crop production and animal husbandry. We also do contract farming. We have goats and chicken, maize, beans, and matoke, what you call bananas. We also do plow and plant for smallholder and medium-scale farmers, mainly maize and beans in rural Murende. The Farm Uganda Limited employs 11 permanent staff, the tractor operators, the farm manager and his team, and we also employ over 20 seasonal workers. These ones help us with weeding and harvesting. They are mainly the youth and the women in the neighborhood of our farm, which is located in Kasanda in rural Mubende. In the past three years, the Farm Uganda has, has done a number of things, including a construction of a humble farmhouse that gives our workers a decent shelter. We have also introduced goats and chicken, and we are currently drilling a water well, which is being manually dug, and we are at 60 feet at the moment. This well will not only serve the farm Uganda, but also the community. Where we live, where the farm is, the closest water source that is hygienic is as far as six miles. We also promote the gospel through partnering with churches in the community. We at the farm are promoting Andrew Mark Discipleship Program and we are trying to work with the community to see how we can spread it further beyond the farm. Thank you Tricord Global, thank you partners to Tricord Global, thank you friends and family of Farm Uganda. We love you. Please look up the Farm Uganda Limited for more. Thank you. Amen. So that's a powerful, that's a powerful testimony of a business school student we had graduate from here. He competed with over 90,000 other students and people who were applying for grants in Africa. And he ended up being chosen out of 90,000 people with his business plan that he learned to do from the business school. And so Tricord Global, which, which is a ministry, a nonprofit that we have, that we deploy investment dollars toward doing microfinance lending in Africa, and it works very simply. Over here, we don't raise donation money because if I take a dollar and I give it over Africa, I've got to come back and raise it again. There's nothing wrong with that because we do it on the ministry side. But I wanted to be able to keep the dollar in the country when I went and not have to come back and re-raise it. And so the way we did that was I learned that in these countries over the course of many years, that in these countries that the normal bank lending rate in many developing countries, I want you to hear me, you, in, here in the United States or other Western nations, what I'm about to say sounds crazy. But in those developing nations, if you have good collateral, good credit, and good income, you are paying about 30% 
annual interest rate on a normal business or investment loan. 30%. I know some people who are paying 40% on it. And so that's crazy. If you go borrow $100,000 at that kind of rate, there's no way you can survive. So what happens is the Lord showed us, showed me, gave me an idea about how to do it over here and raise investment capital through Tricord Global. I started Tricord Global in 2008. The first raise that we did on investments was 2010. So Tricord Global itself from the investment side has been going now for 14 years and it's been doing extremely well. And here's what we do. Over there, instead of them having to borrow at 30% or in some cases up to 42%, what we do is we loan the money to them at 12%, right? And they pay us back typically in simple interest and they pay us back quarterly, the payments they make back to us on interest are quarterly, but over here we raise capital and we pay from that four to eight percent depending on the amount invested and depending on the length of time that someone invests for. And you can either be paid quarterly on this investment or you can be paid uh, at the end in what we call a compound note. Now, now let me explain this to you. What's powerful about this is that we've been able to see so many lives. We now have currently over 12,000 clients that have been impacted through Tricord Global. Some of them have loans up to $250,000. Some of them have loans as low as $50, depending on how the money is deployed. So the way we do it is this. We loan the money at 12%. We get, I'm at 12, they pay us 12%. We pay 4 to 8%. The spread between 8%, it's really about 6.5%, and the 12%, that's the spread that we operate Tricord Global on so we can keep it going. And so if this is something you're interested in, the minimum investment, cash investment, is 20000 The highest investment, we have several seven. We have several seven-figure investors that are, that are participating in Tricord, but the median investment, we usually, if 10 people walk through the back door and say they want to invest, the median investment in Tricord is 100,000. So that's, that's where we are, that's how we function. But the minimum IRA that you can use is 25,000, minimum cash is 20,000. So we have a table in the back, and I can tell you that this is impacting people's lives all over Africa. And so I want to encourage you, if that's something that would be of interest to you, if you go back to the table, uh, you, you can pick up one of these packets. You'll have to leave your name because it is investment material. You'll need to uh, leave your name. But if you'll do that, I believe you'll find it be a blessing for you and for those whose lives are being changed in Africa. Amen. We're going to go to break. Are we, you good? All right, let's take, what are we taking? A 10 minute break? 10 minute break. And we'll be back to tell you where to go. Amen. Well, I trust that uh, nobody hurt herself, did they, in that last session? Everybody okay? Make sure nobody... I, I want to just say something quickly uh, about uh, the ministry here, Andrew Womack Ministries, Karis Bible College. Um, I, I, I want to challenge you, if you've never been a partner, a financial partner with Andrew Womack Ministries, I'd like to encourage you to prayerfully consider that. I know that many, many of you already are partners, and for that, I can tell you we greatly appreciate it. Andrew is going to be doing, I'm giving you a little sneak peek here. I don't think he'll talk about it um, tomorrow morning or tonight, but uh, we, we're coming into a new season, even beyond where we've been on developing the campus. We're also uh, looking at and beginning to be in the first stages of standing up a 24-hour network that will eventually satellite, we call it a satellite network, that will eventually go around the world. And since this is a financial workshop, I just want to share this with you. We've kind of made a decision. Right now, we spend somewhere between uh, 1.5 million and somewhere up to about 2.2 million per month just on construction. Now, some of you may or may not know this, but we, uh, we also, in addition to that, we have uh, well over 800 employees here at Andrew Walmack Ministries Karis Bible College. And uh, many people don't know what I'm about to say, 
but I try to say it when I can so you have a frame of reference, is that in, at Andrew Womack Ministries, this is now one of the largest ministries in the world. And I say that because a lot of people, that's a fact, that's a fact. Um, this year, our fiscal budget, not counting what I'm about to say, our fiscal budget this year, which means it starts in October, October the 1st, is uh, about $120 million a year. And so if you look at the size that we're operating by, in order for us to do what, I just, what I'm about to share, we're going to have to grow to about $145 million to $150 million a year to be able to do that. So th those are big numbers. Right now, the ministry's doing well with construction. We're, we're not only trying to stay on time because of weather, uh, just, but other things that uh, Big Andrew wants to see accomplished. And so I just want to encourage you, if you've never been a partner, I'm going to challenge you about being a financial partner with Andrew Walmack Ministries and, and uh, just encouraging that because it's not just about being large or having things, it's about the impact that the ministry has been and continues to make all over the world. And for those of you who are partners, I want to tell you how much we appreciate it. I just want to continue to encourage you with that. And I'm going to tell you that, that I've learned myself personally, when you sow in ground here at Andrew Womack Ministries, the impact is absolutely phenomenal. So, plus, I will say Andrew Womack is the most authentic, genuine, humble uh, leader I have ever been around in my life. So this place, this place is on solid ground, I can promise you. Uh, both, both spiritually and financially. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. So I want to, I want to pick up a little bit, uh, talking about a couple of things. Uh, my, uh, Luda came up and reminded me, she's my assistant here of a couple of things. Let me just mention this. If, cause some of you here at the break came and asked me some questions and that's part or Luda and that prompted me. We have a, what's called, I think it's a boot camp and it's virtual this is through Wealth Builders, which is a ministry I have that's in Denver. And there, it's a five-day virtual event that you can go, I think, to the back table or you can use this QR code to go right straight to it if you want to register. It's the key to wealth building, how to plant an orchard, which I teach on, when and how to start investing uh, debt budgets in your first step, six forms of passive income, and then starting side hustles and ramping up for some of the young folk and passive income powerhouse, how to create wealth through real estate. And that's a boot camp that we have. And then uh, because a couple of you asked me if I had other materials someplace else. And so you can go to wealthbuilders.org uh, and there's a ton of materials on there. Is I don't know if Ray, Ray, are you in here? Is Ray Patterson in here? Ray, where's Ray at? Where's Ray? Ray's way, well, they can't see you up there. They make you sit up there or something? There's Ray up there. Ray is our business school coordinator here at, at, uh, at Karis. And Ray, if I had one young man in construction business that asked me some really good questions. And if you could raise up there, he, he's a little bit more handsome than I am. You ready? All right. But Ray, you, you ought to come down here later where they can see you, okay? Uh, and I'll introduce you, make, make sure. And then the last thing I'll talk about is we do have a real, we, we do real estate workshops twice a year. And uh, I think there's a, yeah, that's a QR code there. If you're interested in learning about how to do single family one to four units, you can learn from that. So, all right, let's talk about real estate here. And I'm, I'm going to give you some things and then we're going to talk about some things to do. I realized when, when some, some of them came up and asked me some questions, I do want to show one graph. I, I'm trying to see if I actually have it here in this group. Uh, but I don't think, I think I put it in another group I have. I did. I did put it in the other group. Okay, so let's start. Let's go to real estate. And we'll start here on, this is the Case Shiller Composite Home Price Index. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk, talk about some things in real estate today that are gonna surprise some of you who know me pretty well if you've been listening to me uh, in, through here and some other venues. I'm gonna I actually think the real estate market is starting to look better on a couple of indicators that I follow 
uh, the c concern I have about the stock market right now is I'm sitting here on March the 7th, 2024. The stock market, the S&P 500, is trading at about 32 times price and earnings. And the normal, what we would call the, the normal litmus test on price to earnings is about 15 times price to earnings. And I'm, I usually am good and I do still have money in the market. I'm, I won't explain exactly how I have money in the market, but I have money in the market. But usually I feel pretty good about the market most of the time, up to about 22 times earnings, something like that. I feel pretty good, maybe 23. Uh, right now we're at 32 times earnings. And so I can just tell you I'm, that the market itself, I'll just use the old, old, old adage, what goes up must come down. So uh, what I want you to see here is this case uh, Schiller price index that right here, we, you can see this, this, as we, right here, this little gray line, this is the short recession, very, very short recession that we had in, in March of 2020 into about May the 1st, 2020. That's what this is. And you can see how home prices were just kind of in a, in a decent trend right here compared to basic fundamentals. And then you, you're going to see how that we, we kind of went up and then the Fed started raising rates and you saw the market really come down. And that came down for two reasons. It came down because, first of all, interest rates went up. But the second reason it came down is that the inventory of real estate was not out there. So we've been in the lowest that I've seen in my lifetime. We have been in the lowest inventories. That simply means the amount of single family real estate that is on the market for sale, the inventory has been extremely low. It's starting to come back. As a matter of fact, it's jumped up in March of 2024. The inventory itself, it's, it's not up to what I would call normal, but it, it has at least jumped up. So you can go all the way back here on this graph. You can go back to 19, I think that's 1988, right in here is about 87. And you can see the trend of the market. You can see what happened right around where we saw the, the, what we call the Great Recession, which was right here in 08 through 2010, right, right in here. You see the prices and then they kind of leveled. And watch this, you get to COVID, which happened right here. Look what happened to prices. So here's what I'm saying to you, and I'm gonna get, I'm, we're gonna go into some detail here in a second. But what I'm trying to tell you is when you see prices go up like this, and this was true for me, I didn't, I didn't buy in here. I stayed out. I stayed out of the market buying because I wanted to see where the market was going to settle out. Now, I'll show you in a second why I think this, but I think the market itself is starting to settle. It's starting to settle in a little better than what we have been through to this point. Now, here's another graph. This is one that'll help you. I got it from investing.com that if you go back here to 2020, which was when COVID was there, you see what's happening, but coming out of COVID, this is what happened to prices of real estate. And many of you experienced it. Some of you made money on it because you bought real estate back here. Some of you sold in here. I know people who did sell, not, not just their primary home, but also investment properties. And they made some money right here. But then here's what happened is when rates started going up, I want you to see this is the sales prices of houses went down. Now, Colorado, for those of you that live in Colorado, Colorado has held up generally a little bit better. Uh, but I'm even seeing some softening now. Like for example, I like to buy property in Colorado now and I typically, because of where I'm at and what I do, I typically pay cash. I typically buy a little bit better properties. And so I'm gonna start buying again. Now this is the first time I've said this publicly in, at this level that I'm talking about today that I've said this in three years. It's the first time I've said it in three years. I'm gonna start buying some property again uh, and, and the kind of properties I like to buy, the type of properties I like to buy, because I believe right now that uh, the housing prices have started to kind of settle in. Now, here's a, here's a graph. So this has taken us all the way into where we are currently in 2020. Let me go back. This has taken us where we are in 2024. And you can see where the prices begin to go up. Then this is one that is taking us into January of 2025. So we're going back over here. When we look back here, this is the CoreLogic forecast and it indicating home prices 
basically will remain unchanged there in the beginning, right, right in here. Uh, but year to year, uh, currently, this probably will be a little better year. And then we, we go in a little further, we see where it's going to soften a little bit again at about 2.6. So I want to show you this. I act, and I want to say this because I got a ton of graphs here, but I want to tell you this. I really believe we're starting to come into a time, and I'm speaking now more from a national level. Real estate is primarily local. And so when you're looking, you have to make decisions on real estate, whether you're buying investment property uh, right now, let's say single family, one to four unit kind of stuff. You have to base that on where the that particular uh market is and what's functioning. But I mentioned about a recession and you can see kind of some effects of what they're forecasting where you see these, the increase or the appreciation will get a little softer as we go into, for example, 2025. Now here is some of the, of what we've seen in individual markets as far as appreciation. And uh, let's see if I want to show this other one. And so you can see down here in Miami, it's down in that specific area. By the way, there's areas in Florida that are going to go down. I'm going to, show them, I'm going to show you a couple of them. Denver right now is projected to be up about 3%. Houston 2-1. You go to California, you're still getting some of that California effect out there. 4 9 8, 5. Phoenix at 5-4, Chicago. So these are just, you can just kind of see where the market itself is going. But some of these markets are really overpriced. Uh, in Utah, here in Florida, in, up in Washington. And you can see that the probability of price decline right here in some of these markets is pretty high. But let me, let me show you as I get into this, the, some of the overall stuff that I believe is gonna happen for us. This is, a, this is something that I use um, and uh, this is the first time I have shared this publicly at this level uh, about where I think the current forecast is. It's been, it's been a couple of years since I've talked this positive about real estate. Now I talk about real estate uh, when, whenever I'm doing it, when I'm teaching on it, but this is the first time. This is what we call the real estate price to gold ratio. And uh, some of you've heard me probably, hopefully you've heard me teach on this, but right now you can see how low that ratio has gotten where we currently are. So here's what happens. If you look back 120 years, go back 120 years in America, and if you look at the price of one ounce of gold, just look. Now I know it's up today and it's been up here in the last several months, but I'm just talking about the price of gold going back 120 years in America. So I'm going way back. 120 years, if you look at it, typically you could buy a single family home in the U.S. for about 200, the price of about 200 ounces of gold. That's just a figure across the board. When, when, I, when I was looking at it in COVID, right? When I looked at it in COVID and we were getting way up and gold was in around 17, 1800 an ounce, right? Right, remember that, some of you, right? It was, it was getting up to 280 ounces to 300 ounces of gold to buy a single family home. Now that gold has got come, began to come up in price and house prices have softened, believe this or not, this is, this is the lowest I have ever shown this graph ever and I'm going back to 2012. This is the lowest I have ever shown it today in this workshop. It's the lowest I've ever shown it and that is Right now, the U.S. median sale home price is about $395. It was all the way up to $436 last year. I want you to see this. And the price of gold as of today, March 2024, is $2,176. And right now, to buy a median price house in America, not an average price house, a median price house is only 181 and a half ounces of gold. Now you say, what is that telling me, Billy? That's telling you that if real estate will stay 
fairly where it's at, we're gonna come back into a trend of being able to buy again in a place that you don't have to be afraid to buy, that I've, I've been afraid up until I'm talking today that the market was going to get a whole lot softer than what it is right now. But after doing the calculations that I've been doing for a long time, this is one of the best calculations I've ever shown. So for those of you that this applies to, this, this is worth the price of the ticket. So how much did y'all pay to come to this workshop today? Come on now. No, 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 zero, okay. Well, this is worth a whole lot more than zero, I can promise you. So, you know, if it applies to you. So this will show you uh, what I call the, the median home price, the price to gold and the median price of homes. And so when I look here at the 30 year fixed mortgage and I go back here again, it's 1980, I showed you on the interest rates. Now this is <clears throat> 30 year fixed mortgage rate. You can see, and this goes over into uh, present, it's right up into the first part of 2024. You'll, you'll see where it's, come, it's been coming down a little bit right here. And this, this, is that, this is the bottom part of that X I showed you earlier. This is the third year. So what this is doing right here is that it's causing housing prices to get softer. So if you look at it here, this right here is, of course, the 30-year rate. You see that? And uh, if you see that, then this is here. Let me make sure I got my deals right. This is the home. Red is home prices. And the blue line is the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And right now it's come down right about here. And this line is going across here like this. It's not going up right now. It's starting to trend down just a little bit. So that's giving you kind of some concepts. And I got to watch my clock here because I want to talk about some things. Now, in a second, I'm going to do some q and I got a couple more I want to show you. I got some Q&A and I'll talk a little bit about Bitcoin if and I may try to do that, or cryptocurrency in, in q and I've got some stuff up here on gold. If I have time, I'll go to it. Uh, I don't know why I wrote Bitcoin and crypto. It should, that's just one thing. I must have been talking to somebody when I did it uh, to write both of them. And so I'm going to do some Q&A with you. How many of you want to do some Q&A? Oh, a couple of you? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let me do a couple more of these. So when I'm looking here, uh, this is household net worth. And I put this one in here on purpose because I just wanted to show you uh, where, how much uh, household net worth <clears throat> has actually come down. And you can see that it kind of hit a peak with all that money supply that I told you, I talked to you about low interest rates. And now you can see the effect that that's actually having, actually having on um, uh, people's spending power and people's ability to be able to invest. Now I'm going to show you this graph. Now this next graph, I want to give you a, a little bit of a warning on, okay? I just told you that I thought that where we were in real estate right now is a good time. It's the first time I've said this publicly. I'm going to put this next graph up here on pers personally because I want to, I personally decided to put it in because I want to balance out something of when I'm talking about real estate. When I'm showing you these, these kind of what I call national numbers, you have to look at real estate from a local perspective. Now, I'm going to give you, seriously, all jokes aside, I'm going to give you a ratio that's, pri that's worth, if, if it applies to you, it's worth the price of everything you spent to come out here to the conference. If you flew, it's worth your ticket, your rental car, your food, and your hotel, Okay all balled up in one, and it's this, that there's one primary way that you value real estate. Now, right now, when I say real estate, I'm talking about single family, one to four units. Commercial real estate, I can talk to you about it, about how, you know, the proper way to value it, but right now, single family real estate, <clears throat> what you're looking for in single family real estate is you want to be somewhere between two to four times the price needs to be two to four times the price, median price of a house needs to be two to four times median income. 
So that just simply means if you Google, let's just, the, these numbers aren't accurate that I'm going to give you, meaning the example. But let's say that if you Google a, a zip code or a metro area, Denver, or if you do a zip code, uh, Woodland Park, and you Google it and you ask in Google, median, don't use average, median price of a home, uh, excuse me, median price, uh, median household income, and you divide that into the price of a home if it's more than four times. So let's say the median income was 50000 household income, which I know it's a lot higher, but I'm trying to do it for a normal deal. Then that's telling me that I shouldn't be paying more than 200000 for a house. We have all kinds of markets in America right now where the median income is below 50000 Now in Colorado, you can't, it's impossible to find a household income that's that low meaning generally across the board. So the point is, is when I show you this next graph, <coughs> we're still nationally, uh, this graph here, we're still nationally, price to income ratio nationally, we're still above five. Which candidly, from where we've been, this, this, is, this was 2022, but we're, we're about right here so you, you still have to look at the markets. You can't, just, uh, you can't just go whole hog and look. You Google median price home compared to median price income. And if you get up over four times. Now, Miss Becky, Miss Becky, who I will pay if she likes a house, I will pay up to six times just because she likes it. but I'm not paying more than six times. I don't care how much she likes it because I know if it's our personal house, I have a home here in Woodland Park and I have a home in Lone Tree in Denver. <clears throat> and I know when I'm looking at those properties, I'm trying to, I'm looking at my household incomes in those areas. And I bought every, every property that I personally live in now, which primarily is these two places that I live in now, I always stay six or below for the houses she likes. Now, I want to give you some marriage advice. Never buy a house your wife doesn't like. <laughs> that was free. I'm not getting that's just that's totally free. And then this is one of the last ones, and then we'll I'm gonna do a couple other things. Um, median and average US home price versus uh, uh, this median home price I'm talking about versus wage growth. This will be my last one like this. <clears throat> then I want to do one last thing on pro values. The right here, if you're looking, you can see how close the home prices and wage growth went together. Everybody see that? So I'm going back 91, 87, and we kind of stuck there, kind of going into the early 2000s. Then we went over to the Great Recession. You see how it went. And I want you to look at how high we've been. So the truth is, when we're looking at this uh, growth, and I'm not, I'm not just talking politics now, but we need a president that's going to help us with some of this stuff. I, I hope I'm in the right crowd here. Am I in the right crowd? So right here, uh, this gap is one concern I wanted to show you. This is actually the graph I was talking about, <clears throat> that we do have a measure of split between what we see as wage growth. This is only wage growth. It's not wages. You, could, you do wages when you do the median price uh, of a home to median, uh, the median income of that home. But this is just showing you that wage growth hasn't kept up. That does not mean that everybody's wage growth has not kept up because you, maybe your wage growth has, many of you it probably has, so you don't have this kind of disparity. But I'm just showing you across the, across the uh, spectrum, it's there. And what that means is you're going to have fire, fewer buyers in the market. What that can mean is that you can get better deals right now than you could got before. The other part it means is, is you don't ever overpay. And if you'll follow the median income thing and never go above six times, you'll be fine. Now, I'm going to change on you, and then, I'm going to, and then I'll do quickly, I got Q&A. I'm going to leave 15 minutes Q&A based on that. Is that good? 
14. This is biblical and pro-values investing. One of the things that I wanna, I wanna talk to you about is a lot of times we have our money and this is more of our liquidity, money we may have in stocks or bonds or money we may even have in a money market fund. Uh, in some instances, uh, certificates of deposit, it just depends. But you have companies out there that are woke companies that are anti what we stand for. Do you, do you know that? I think everybody's getting more educated on that. One of those is BlackRock, right? And in fact, I've even seen where BlackRock has tried to get more conservative. Uh, I, I laugh about it because of how far they went with what's called DEI and ESG, all of that stuff that they went for. But these companies are that way. In fact, there's some companies up here right now in these next couple of slides. We, I don't think uh, Chad and I put up here before. Uh, this is another slide that has a few of those and a couple of others that just shows some of the companies that um, literally that are doing things that are totally against what we would consider our biblical or our pro-value stance. And let me say something to all of you. When you're investing your money, don't invest your money, in, especially owning companies, don't invest your money in stuff that is 100% against what you believe or that is directly opposed to what the Bible teaches. I mean, I don't mean just as a different idea, but I'm talking they are promoting stuff that is totally against what we know is true scripturally. And why would you put your money in those? In fact, I'll just tell you, don't, and I'll get off my soapbox, some of you have your money right here. I found out I had an old account from years ago that I was helping somebody with, true story, another ministry, and I'd put some money over there and I got this notice, I don't know how we got it, I got this notice that I, I'd forgotten about it, it had to be 15, at least 15 years ago, it had to be. And uh, I still had $1,000 in there. So I took it out of Wells Fargo as quick as I could. I had, a, I had a main, one of the main ministries, or if I said the person's name, you would know who I'm talking about. Every one of you know who I'm talking about. I had a ministry call me one night about five o'clock in the afternoon. And the wife was on the phone. She was crying. I don't know what we're going to do. And I said, well, you know, settle down. Just what, what's going on? And she said, <clears throat> They closed our accounts and they kept our money. They closed our accounts and they kept our money. And I said, what are you talking about? And she told me, and it was Wells Fargo, and they completely locked up the entire ministry accounts in that situation and froze them and tried to keep them frozen for about, they were telling them, at least two weeks. So they couldn't operate, couldn't write a check, couldn't do anything. So I got on the phone, I talked to the founder, and then we started working, and we got their money out of there in two days, completely closed the accounts, got out of there, and went over to a ministry-friendly, pro-values, First and Second Amendment bank that was going to support what they're doing. And I am telling you today, the reason they closed it is because of his vocal voice on politics. That's the reason they did it. And, he, and the politics that he's espousing or the biblical values that he's espousing are exactly what we believe if you're coming here to Karis Bible College. And so I'm saying, don't put your money to support stuff like that. That's, I should be getting better amens than I'm getting, amen. And so we have a pro-values index of companies that you can get for free. This is a, be a blessing to you. You can go to, <clears throat> doesn't cost a penny. You just go there. You can go to wealthbuilders.net front slash invest. Wealthbuilders.net. Is that right, Chad? Am I doing good on this? Wealthbuilders.net front slash invest. And we have a brand new, and listen, guys, no joke. We didn't just pull this off some other website. Chad works with, <clears throat> we work with a group that helps us build these indexes that support what we believe and, and what we want. And so I want to encourage you to go there and get that uh, to make sure that uh, you are, you're locating. Here's some of those companies. For example, these are ones that, and believe it or not, Coca-Cola consolidated. This is not the normal Coca-Cola. It's, uh, what is it, like the parent or the, huh? The what? It's the bottling company for Coke. 
And they are very conservative. Coke is not, but the bottling company is very conservative for First and Second Amendment values and other things. So these are some of the companies you can see <clears throat> that would be, for example, in the index as well. But there's others as well that have Christian CEOs, Bible-believing, and uh, no, there's no reason to put your money in other things. So what I want to do, now look, I know I haven't talked about a couple of things that I do have in here, but what I'll do is I'll see what kind of questions you have, and I'll, I'll go with the flow on responding to that. So I think we have microphones. Do we have microphones? Where's our, where are my mic runners? I got one here, one there. Are we, are we having them? Can we just take the mics to them? Y'all define doing that? Can y'all do that? Okay, so who has a question? Yeah, they're going up. I think they're running in different places. All right, I don't know. Where am I at? Over here? Okay. Um, I have a question that's not really related to everything you've been talking to, but I started a small business as an electrical contractor about a year and a half ago. Do you think it would be wise for me to spend a good amount of money on advertising? Everything I've got so far has just been word of mouth. Hey, stand up where I can see and hear you. Sorry about that. <laughs> and turn his mic up if you don't mind a little bit so I can hear him. But the monitors and stuff up here aren't on, I don't think, or are they, Matt? Okay, sorry about that. No, that's fine. The question I had was, um, I started an electrical contracting company about a year and a half ago. Okay. And my business goes up and down quite a bit. Do you suggest putting some money into advertising? Everything I've gotten so far has just been word of mouth. Well, uh, well I'd have to ask you a couple of questions, but the first thing you need to look at is where, what are your primary revenue streams, right? So if you're an electrical contractor, if, if, you're, if that means you're actually installing electricity or meaning the wiring or whatever you're doing, uh, and that's a primary revenue stream, then one of the things you're, you would look for, I'm gonna say something now to everybody, you're looking for enterprise competency and enterprise capacity to, to try to say, where can I be the most efficient and get my revenue streams or my dollars the quickest? And then wherever that is, that's where, that is your, what we call your target market audience that you wanna aim for in your advertising. The biggest mistake that, that small, one of the biggest mistakes that small business owners make is they do what's called broadcast advertising. And today with social media, you can be, and other things, you can be much more targeted than you used to could be historically. So what I would do is find out what you want your primary revenue streams to be. And I'm giving you better advice than some of them may know. Find out what your primary revenue streams need to be and target, find out who that target audience is that's gonna pay you. An example would be, you can be an electrical contractor and you, could, you can do individual homes or you can do commercial buildings. You could be an electric contractor and you could specialize in certain kinds of things that would, would help certain companies in a particular thing or you could do brand new, new home builds. There's all kinds of things you can do. So find out where you want your primary revenue streams where it's most profitable, focus your advertising and your marketing on that. And you got to focus, right? Here's the question you always have to answer. How do you hunt a moose? And how you hunt a moose is you got to go where a, hunt, where a moose lives, where a moose works, where a moose plays, and then you target that area. And if your revenue streams are good, you stay there, maybe do one other moose, but you have at least two, what I call recurring revenue streams, put your marketing toward that, all right? Thank you. Okay, who else I got? Yes, sir. Thanks for taking this question. Uh, if you have a large amount of money in um, traditional 401ks or IRA, how do you take that out to get it into real estate? Obviously, you know, I'm pre-retirement, so what's the best way to do that? Well, if you're 401k and you're still working for that company, uh, I believe the timetable is about six months you got to be away from the company before you can roll that 401k over. But if you, if you get it over into an IRA, then we do some strategy teaching on how you can use your IRA and do alternative investments. I don't, didn't have time in this kind of setting to cover that, but we, you, know, you can invest in real estate and, and I wouldn't advise you to direct to invest directly from your IRA into real estate. 
I, invest, I encourage you to invest, form a company that you own, and then you can invest in that company with your IRA, then that company can invest in real estate, or you can buy gold and silver. There are many other alternative investments, depending on where your IRA is, that you could invest in, as well as the normal uh, investments that we're talking about, like here with our Wealth Builder Investment Pro Value Index, there's things you can do there and you just roll that over. But if you're really interested, just go back to the table and the guys can help you uh, and with, with a whole lot of specifics on how to do that. That good? All right. I've got a friend that's kind of pushing me or encouraging me in that crypto. Mm -hmm. I have no understanding about it. Well, it went from the, la the Bitcoin went from the latest, the last low price of about 16,000. I think it's up to 60. Anybody know where it's at today? 69. How much? 69. Yeah, so it's gone up. So again, so th this is my patent answer on crypto uh, right now. This is my patent answer is that cryptocurrency including Bitcoin in, in and of itself has no inherent intrinsic value. And the, the closest thing I can get to why Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, uh, who just, Charlie Munger just passed away, he was 99. He, he, he did not believe in crypto because it didn't have any inherent, what we call intrinsic value. Uh, I do believe that digital currency uh, is coming. And meaning by that, I mean, that at some point we will move from fiat currency, at some point we'll, we'll move to more of a, of a true, uh, some type of value standard back crypto. Now, here's what I wanna say, and this, I think it's worth the price of the ticket for some of you. I believe, for example, if you take Bitcoin, one of the things that's positive about Bitcoin is the actual technology that's behind Bitcoin. The actual tech, the way Bitcoin was created and written, that Bitcoin, some other cryptocurrencies, some have, some don't, have that, that kind of uh, positive technology behind it. What's going to happen is, is all of these digital currencies, uh, wherever they're being started, anywhere in the world, at some point they're going to start being regulated. What we don't know uh, is what the effect of that is going to be. I know there's a lot of stuff on the internet. Uh, about, about getting around that, not doing that, and all of those things. But at some point, and I know that uh, the government, even, even those uh, that we would favor politically, I know many are looking at how to handle Bitcoin. But I will say to you, honestly and forthrightly, I have some money invested in it, okay? But I don't invest right now any of my real money in it. I invest play money. Now, I've, I've made some money with the play money, and I'm happy for that. But right now, I don't have what I call any of my serious money in it. But if, if you want to buy, like I bought some when it was cheaper, and I'm happy I did. I also have a little bit of amount in some of the exchanges. But the bigger amounts that I invest in what I do uh, on several fronts, uh, I don't put any what I call my real money toward it. So here's what I want to say. How many of you remember when everybody in the Christian world was talking about getting into the Iraqi denarii? Do I have any witnesses or not? Okay, how much money have you made in the denarii? Yeah, exactly. That what they said when you didn't hear them is zero. In other words, because, so you just, you, look, the reason I take the time to do these kind of workshops Right? It's not that there's not other things to talk about. I, could see, I mean, I could teach on all kinds of things in a finance workshop. I talk about these kind of things in this kind of workshop because I want to help you begin to understand you have to have some frame of reference of understanding. You're not just going to drift to the top of the mountain. And there's got to be some things that you learn to do intentionally with your finances to get you there. And you have to learn to be, as Jesus said, Matthew chapter 10, you have to learn to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And when it comes to finances, you have to be wise as a serpent. I mean, here at a AWM, right, the kind of budget we operate with, there, can I tell you there are some people who don't like me? I know you found that strange, right? They wouldn't like me. But I have to say no. Ray, stand up. Let me introduce you. This is, this is Ray Patterson. He is our business school coordinator. And so any of the smaller businesses in here, you have some questions uh, 
I want you to talk, if they come up to you on the business model canvas and some of the other tools we use, primary tools, that'll help some of them a lot. Amen. How many of you know we need to be a blessing? All right, who else? I had, where are we at? Yeah. Right here. Okay. What's your thoughts on buying a deed-restricted primary residence home in resort areas with an appreciation cap in resort areas like Breckenridge, Colorado? Okay, I didn't hear the first part. I heard Breckenridge. What was the first part? Uh, what's your thoughts on buying a deed-restricted primary residence home? Do you mean uh, that you would own a quarter share, half share of it when you say deed restricted? Are you talking about conservation deed restriction? Uh, it'd be full ownership, full ownership workforce housing. Full ownership workforce housing. Yeah, so that is deed restricted. So you have to. Mm -hmm. you, well, the the issue, the the big issue you're going to run into there, on on that is uh, you can run into with the municipality is what's called rent controls. And so you have to be aware of that when you get into them. Right now, some of those, what I call spreads, in some of those instances can look pretty good. Price you're paying, what you're going to get paid. The problem you could have is down the road. And so the, when, when you have those deed restrictions, and if, they, if they're in the deed restrictions on who's setting that rent, that's what you have to watch out for. So if somebody's setting that rent, my advice, stay out. If somebody else is going to set my rent, I'm out. All right? Okay, I seen you had BlackRock on there. What about Vanguard? Where do they stand? Not good. <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, the, this DNI, DEI has infected... Uh, <clears throat> God bless Florida. And so some of these companies have become so woke. I, I got to be careful here. I'll turn off the live stream. <laughs> Not good. So if you, if you go back to, uh, I mean, <clears throat> Vanguard's got some of the, you know, it still has, I think, the, some of the, uh, cheapest index funds you can get. So the cost effectiveness of Vanguard from that perspective is good, but as far as what they stand for, it's not good. So that's a quick answer. All right. Who else? Where? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, my question was uh, regarding uh, you spoke about real estate for the single family uh -huh. or the um, what, one to four units. Uh -huh. Okay. If you're in a city that you have an uh, influx of people moving in monthly, and you have, instead of land being cleared for single family homes, you see a, apartment complexes coming up. Everywhere you look, it's apartment complexes. What would be a strategy that we could use for single families? Well, so if your rents are good, you can buy some of those new properties. I was advising that about two years ago, uh, up to six months ago on targeting new construction because the, the builders were, and still are by the way, offering really low mortgage rates. I helped someone in my office get into their new home and they locked in, with my help, they locked in a 30-year uh, 4.99% interest rate that, that does not adjust. It stays 4.99 for the entire 30-year period, and it didn't cost one penny for, to get the rate bought down. And that's because the builder owned the mortgage company too, and so they combined what they're selling the house for uh, you know, for the mortgage company. So the point of that, meaning they combine the two, so you can, you can target new homes. You got to be, make sure you're not overpaying. That's one thing you got to watch for. But most of the time right now, you can get really good interest rates if you're a first or second time home buyer in those kind of settings. And a, a good advice, I don't know how old you are, but you look pretty young. Good advice is you could buy one of those, live in it, move the next year, buy another one. So you know, I know wives don't like to do that, but if you want to be an investor, that's a really cheap financing way to get started, and it's legal. It's not unethical. Uh, you can do that as long as you're willing to move. All right, listen, you guys have been great. Thank you so much, and I know I didn't cover everything I wanted to, everything I had, but y'all have been awesome, 
And uh, we appreciate you, Mike. Come back. God bless you.